Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. If you've been listening to this podcast, my guess is that you are at least a little bit politically active, and I bet you've posted something political on social media this year, or maybe you've put on a pink hat and marched in the streets, or spoken up at a town hall, or maybe even signed a petition. If we're talking about Facebook posts, perhaps you braced for a reaction from a relative who hates your politics, but you probably did not worry about retribution from the government. Here in America, it's easy to forget that not everyone shares that same freedom. In Russia, for example, you can be fined for posting gay pride images on social media. And in Hong Kong, protesters cover their faces so they won't be identified by the authorities. Other countries encroach on their citizens' personal freedoms in smaller ways. In Switzerland, for example, the government actually regulates what you can name your baby. Imagine. But here, it's a point of national pride that we have the freedom to name our babies Chardonnay or Danger or King, Messiah or whatever. We can publicly declare whatever outlandish conspiracy theory we want. We can even, if we want to, build a cathedral of junk in our backyards. That's a real thing in Austin, Texas, by the way. And that freedom, that's by design. I'm not encouraging you to do any of those things, but I do think the basic freedoms at the heart of our democracy are incredibly important to acknowledge and defend. So what are the institutions and processes that make our free society possible? And what can we do to make sure our free society stays free? That was the question I asked this season, and I spoke to a treasure trove of people who had some answers. In this episode, I'm going to take you back to some of those conversations. When I began wondering how our democracy can be as free as possible, I realized I needed to start with the basics. In a democracy, citizens have to know how the system works. That's why I talked to the hosts of Civics 101, a podcast refresher course about the basics of how American democracy works. It's produced by New Hampshire Public Radio and hosted by Hannah McCarthy and Nick Capodice. Just like Future Hindsight, Civics 101 was created in response to the 2016 election when listeners were hungry for information about a system that seemed to have been turned on its head. Here's a bit of my interview with Nick and Hannah. It is my belief that the most important thing a citizen can do is to understand the system in which she lives. And that can only come from admitting that you don't know something. Uh, <laughs> in, in the wake of all of, of the 2016 election, there were a lot of uh, hot takes. It was everybody going on and writing these think pieces with the assumption that everybody knew everything about how our political system worked. And that made people afraid to admit that they didn't know what the chief of staff did or the secretary of defense did. And so um, I think it's one of the most crucial steps is to be willing to say, I have no idea. Um, what the people in the House of Representatives do. I learned about it in school a little bit, but I forgot since then. If we don't go back and re-examine the system that we work in, if we don't start there, then what difference does the rest make? If you don't understand the system you're in, you can't change it. Yeah. What do you think? I think of it less of what is our responsibility and more of how can we empower ourselves It doesn't matter that these systems exist, that these protections exist, that you have these rights. It does not matter if you do not know how they work and you do not know how to enforce them for yourself. We have to know how to utilize this democracy because otherwise it doesn't matter that you live here in this country because you will be taken advantage of. I hate to say it, you know, but you will be. You can't trust necessarily that these things will be enforced for you. Where do you think is the most common gap in the understanding of your audience in terms of like, well, how can I make the government work for me? Why is it that I feel so disempowered? What kind of questions do you get there? I I think it's not isn't related to the questions we get uh, as opposed to the response to how we cover our topics. I have a colleague who said to me, 
there are going to be people out there who dislike your show and will accuse you of being a biased show just because you acknowledge the point of women and people of color throughout history in America's history, just by mentioning that, just by ex- acknowledging the existence of women and people of color as a facet of our democracy, mm-hmm. we are a left-leaning, we are a biased podcast. And every episode, I would get to a point in my script where I would s- talk to our executive producer and say, it all comes down to slavery. <laughs> all of it. Everything. Everything comes down to slavery and the subjugation of women in this nation. And I think that it makes people very uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable, especially when you've been raised and taught about these gleaming elements of American democracy that you can really take pride in. When you start to pry them apart and you see the guts, you realize that, in fact, they exist in part because they were built on the backs of people that made it easy for them to exist. Not everything, but many things in this nation were built by taking advantage of people. And I think that's really hard for people to hear and accept because you why would you want to when you can think of us as this as this glorious nation why would you want to confront that element of the way that our democracy works it's very complicated and that's why your show is so great because it really tries to unpack everything for your everyday person like you said who hasn't done civics since high school long time we've forgotten but so let's talk about your audience you oh, yeah. have your show in schools what is your demographic in schools how old are the kids so the show has uh, a lot of students majority high school students who are, who listen to the show at the at being forced to by their teachers of course uh, and what they've started doing is listening to them in class also a lot of teachers have started to assign our episodes for homework before they do a topic, like let's say they're going to do Articles of Confederation the next day in class. Civics is just starting to be demanded in all our 50 wonderful states as sort of like, oh, okay, we need to start doing this. We've lost civic education. We don't teach it as much anymore. Now we got to get back into it because things are crazy right now. <laughs> yeah, it is not a spectator sport. You know, it's true. It really isn't. If you want this democracy to go on being a democracy, you got to play the game. Yeah. Hannah's right. It's definitely not a spectator sport. Making sure our democracy is a functional system requires a lot of us. And the prerequisite is to understand the complexity. After the show, go add Civics 101 to your playlist. So we get that a free society needs citizens who understand how the system works. But then the next step is to understand what is actually going on right now. Personally, I listen to NPR in the morning while I have breakfast with my kids, and then I make them discuss the news with me. Poor kids. I listen to the Washington Post's podcast, Daily 202, while I brush my teeth, and then throughout the day, I'm reading two or three newspapers and following what cable news anchors are saying on Twitter. It's a constant thing. And that's all thanks to the First Amendment's protection of free speech. Freedom of speech includes the freedom of the press to do their job without censorship. Unfortunately, freedom of the press is under attack. Right now, the Senate is severely restricting journalists' access to the impeachment trial. Reporters who used to be able to talk to senators freely in the halls are now confined to holding areas. They're actually being kept behind ropes. This tendency to see the press as the enemy is coming straight from President Trump. That's one of the things I discussed with Suzanne Nossel. She's the CEO of PEN America, which is an organization that protects freedom of expression here and around the world. Suzanne talked to me about how Trump's rhetoric has made it harder for journalists to get real information to us. The courts have found that there is a special role for the press in our society. They've recognized the importance of a free press to upholding our democracy, holding government accountable, informing people, providing a vehicle for enlightenment and debate on important issues. But what we see now with the president directly attacking credible news sources, denigrating individual journalists, is trying to discredit credible news coverage is really unprecedented. I I don't think that's something that 
the framers of the Constitution necessarily foresaw when they were putting together the Bill of Rights. But we do have a president who is engaging in that. And it's complicated because the president has his own First Amendment rights. He's also a citizen. So he can needle a journalist. He can call someone out by name. He can say that he dislikes the Washington Post or the New York Times. He's free to do that. There's not much we can do to constrain him from expressing himself in that way. That's the First Amendment. But what the president can't do, but has done, is to mobilize the power of the federal government to retaliate against coverage that he does not like. So when the president withdraws a hard pass, a White House press credential from a journalist in retaliation for harsh questioning, that is the action of government to inhibit freedom of speech. So the president's a government official, so he can't take an action that uses the power of the federal government to punish speech and to deter speech. He wants journalists to operate on the premise that if they cross him, he's going to come after them. That retributive impulse, I think, is something we have not seen before and something that quite clearly contravenes the First Amendment. What are the repercussions of dampening free speech, or in this case, specifically negative reporting, potentially? We see disturbing ripple effects from this behavior. We see officials at the state and the city level having their own retributive impulses, going after journalists, excluding journalists from state houses. We see the president at his rallies goading his supporters into hostile sentiment and in some cases action toward journalists, cameramen, media outlets are having to assign bodyguards for their journalists when they cover Trump rallies because he has mobilized his supporters into believing that they are, in his words, the enemy of the American people. For somebody like myself who works in an international organization, we know these tactics well. They come straight out of the authoritarian playbook. It, it was always the case until recently that when authoritarian leaders around the world would menace journalists, jail journalists, brutalize journalists in different ways, the United States that you'd rely on to speak out against that and to be a, a forceful voice on behalf of press freedom and free expression. So it's really distressing to see that withering away of American moral leadership on free speech issues. The president has the freedom of speech to say, this is fake news. But at what point is it an abuse? We've sued the president of the United States under the First Amendment because of his acts of retaliation against journalists and the media. You know, in, in the case of the president, it's an abuse when he mobilizes the machinery of the federal government to actually retaliate and exact a reprisal against speech. That's where he crosses the line into action that contravenes the Constitution. I think one of the things that is really difficult to parse as an everyday person who maybe doesn't read every single newspaper is figuring out what is false news, like truly false news. Free speech is about having a polity that can debate, that can sort fact from falsehood, that can reason, you know, where information and insights come to light and can surface. And through that deliberation, you can form sound policies. People can decide who to vote for. You can resolve social problems. And when the discourse becomes polluted by false information, it's completely misleading. We saw that and continue to see that as a very real danger. We see some of the effects now. Americans are just tuning out. They have become kind of inured to the news. They don't know what to believe. And so we are very concerned about this kind of erosion in the common facts base that undergirds a democracy. You can read Penn's report about how fake news is impacting elections at Penn.org. Look for a report called Truth on the Ballot. It calls for candidates and political parties to sign a pledge against fraudulent news. So voting is the ultimate tool of accountability and your ultimate way of making your voice heard. But even though it is the cornerstone of a democratic society, 
the way we actually cast our votes can seem haphazard and antiquated. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. On an election day a while back, I turned up at my usual polling place. It was in an apartment building, and it was empty. Not a single election official was there. It took me a while to figure out that they had changed the polling place to a nearby school, and the information about the location change simply never got to me. But why isn't it easier to get all the information we need by election day? I had an enlightening conversation with Seth Flaxman of Democracy Works. He was inspired to figure out a way to make voting simpler and more seamless after he himself missed out on voting as a graduate student. I was trying to vote back home in New York my like first time, and I missed the deadline to apply to vote by mail. And then the second time, I like forgot to get the ballot in by the deadline. And then I was like, okay, like enough of this. I'm going to register uh, up at school. And then I like had this experience, like walking down some weird side street and like seeing a sandwich board in the evening. It was like election day was today, and I was like, really? Like this is how you're supposed to find out that an election is happening now in the future? <laughs> and put those two threads together and was able to then research, like, how big a problem is this for how many people? Is this just me? Is this the bulk of the reason why people aren't voting? And there's good data on this. The census studies why people aren't voting every two years. And the bulk of the reasons are like all very similar to the issues I was experiencing. So it all sort of came together in that moment. What does the data show us about why people aren't voting? Between like 50 and 60 percent of non-voters in a given election aren't voting for a dozen different process issues. The biggest ones being like too busy, forgot, didn't know, like missed a deadline, but also like weather, disability, didn't have transportation. And so all of these things sort of add up. Why do we vote the way that we do? If it doesn't make any sense, we are only voting on a Tuesday because that was convenient in the 1700s. Sunday was for church. Monday, you'd travel to the county seat. Tuesday, you would vote in the town square and you'd be back home for market day on Wednesday. And so the real tradition in the U.S. is make voting convenient, like make it fit the way we live. And now the majority of non-voters are just saying it's not convenient. It doesn't fit the way we live anymore. You started Democracy Works, which is really, in my mind, one-stop shopping for bringing our democracy into the 21st century with technology. And your first initiative was TurboVote. What is TurboVote? How does it work? So it was based on my own experience where I went online after missing all these elections. And I was like, I'm sure the internet has solved this already. I just need to sign up for something that will text me whatever I need to do to vote in all of my elections and stay registered. And was shocked, honestly, that that didn't exist and started thinking about how to design a system where you would sign up and then you would get text or email notifications saying, you know, today is your registration deadline. Here is the form you need. But also, if you need to vote by mail, send it in by this date. Here is the form itself. Here's where your polling place is. All the different steps that can trip people up. Just turn it into a sort of concierge service that reminds you about everything you need in order to vote, including, you know, send you to Ballotpedia or any other guide. And so that that is TurboVote. And that's the vision behind the idea. And after building TurboVote, we said, OK, this is great. But if you build a site and no one uses it, it doesn't matter. So we focused explicitly on partnerships. How do we build TurboVote into the institutions or sites that people go to every day? So that meant last year, for example, Snap sent out a mass snap to their users about signing up for TurboVote. You didn't have to go to TurboVote. Snap pushed it out to you. We work with around 130 colleges around the country right now trying to integrate TurboVote into like pre-semester check-in or class registration or how do you sort of make it a uh, part of the just normal experience. So 63% of our subscribers are millennials or younger. And so that's that's big. And your goal is to help America reach 80% voter turnout by 2024. That is super ambitious. Yeah, it came from a conversation back in late 2015 where I had this deck I was going around showing people. My vision was like, let's get to 80% turnout, like at least a 20-point increase in turnout across all elections. Because if we keep just trying to aim for small things, we're only going to get small things. (laughs) 
TurboVote now has more than 7 million users. If you want election day reminders, information about what's going on on the ballot, and your voting location, you can sign up at TurboVote.org. Meanwhile, Seth's organization Democracy Works is trying to modernize the voting system in other ways. They're working with states who make voting locations easy to Google. They're trying to make voting by mail easier. And they're working with the Department of Homeland Security to make the voting infrastructure more secure. Because, you know, Russia. Okay, so say Election Day has come and gone. Then what? A free society can only stay free if regular people get involved in the decision making. And it's by design that our democratic system has plenty of ways for us to participate. You can make regular calls to your elected officials, campaign for a city council candidate that you like, speak up at a school board meeting if you have ideas for improvements. This kind of civic engagement can have real impact. I've seen it in my own neighborhood. A few years ago, I live in Manhattan, a developer wanted to construct a tower much taller than anything else around it, but they needed permission from the local community board to get a zoning exception. Well, a lot of my neighbors didn't want such a big building towering over their homes, so they made their voices heard in the community board meetings. It was just regular people speaking up against a powerful real estate developer, and they won. I recently heard about an interesting way that people can be even more directly involved in the legislative process. Citizens' assemblies. In citizens' assemblies, regular people are empowered to do much more than just cast a vote. They're trusted to weigh evidence, make nuanced policy decisions, and become deep stakeholders in civic life. It's not a widely practiced method of citizen involvement but it has a lot of potential. I talked to Jane Souter and David Farrell, two political scientists who helped found the Irish Citizens' Assembly. They took me back to the political atmosphere in 2008 and 2009 that inspired the formation of the Assembly. It was right in the middle of the global economic meltdown. This was the worst economic crisis in the history of our state. The the economy was on its knees Banks were closing down or fleeing from the state. Uh, People's unemployment levels were shooting through the roof. And you had a lot of anger. So it wasn't just an economic crisis. It was a political crisis. It was an existential crisis. And our rationale was really quite simple. It was rather than have angry citizens outside banging at the gates, why not bring a group of citizens into the room and into the heart of the process and let them have a say about what kind of Ireland we want for the future? Tell me about how you managed to pull this off, because in the U.S., this seems like an unlikely project. That's one of the things that, uh, like everybody says, there's always a large number of reasons why this can't be done. And one of it is it couldn't possibly happen here. So we were told, well, the Dutch and the Canadian citizens were very sensible, but there's no way that it could happen in Ireland, that Irish citizens couldn't be trusted with this or the problems were too intractable or we already had a citizen assembly and it was called our parliament. Our job, as we saw it, was to persuade the politicians and media that this could work in Ireland and that it was worthwhile and that you could trust the citizens. This is what we consistently said and we were laughed out of court. How do you persuade the government to say, OK, let's do this and we will listen to the results that you have found through this process? So what was really different about the National Citizen Assembly we had is that we went to a polling company and we asked them to find randomly selected people. So people who never volunteered for anything in their lives. In fact, one of the women hadn't voted in decades. And we sat them down for a weekend and we got them to think about issues like tax and spending, because as David said, we're in the middle of an existential crisis there. And we got them to think about political reform. And in fact, they came up with really sensible suggestions. Normally, politicians assume that all citizens want is more spending and less taxes. But in fact, this group of citizens
reasons when they were presented with balanced evidence from right-wing economists and left-wing economists, trade union people, business and employer and industry type people, they agreed that in fact in some areas they should pay more taxes. And there were particular areas then that they really didn't want the government to cut spending in. So they came to compromises, they came to nuanced kind of policy positions. They realised the kind of compromises that uh, politics required and that it couldn't be a black and white, take it or leave it kind of situation. So I think the politicians found that quite inspiring because they were used to citizens only coming to them when they needed something. They weren't used to listening to citizens about broader policy agendas. And uh, that's one of the reasons that they decided to give it a whirl themselves. The Citizens' Assembly is set up by government. It's run by civil servants and an independent chair appointed by the government. And it is tasked with coming up with recommendations on whatever topic it's been asked to consider. When it produces its report, that report then goes back to the parliament to discuss. Mm, Fantastic. What have you learned from this process about the public that you didn't expect to learn and made you think differently about democracy? You know, there's a lot of talk about democracies in peril, democratic decline, but... The Irish experience is showing that through innovation, through the use of citizens' assemblies where you're bringing regular citizens into the room, that perhaps we have a way through this dreadful morass of democratic problems. The success of the Irish Citizens' Assembly really shows that people can think for themselves. They're fully capable of making complex, decisions. And that's something we need to let our politicians know. I am happy to wrap up on that note of hope and possibility. Having spent the last several months talking to so many amazing people about the ways we can make our democracy work better, I feel like I'm getting a PhD in what's possible. I want to hold on to that feeling of hope in the next season. We'll need it because season nine tackles an issue that leaves so many of us feeling doomed, climate change. I'll be talking to people who can tell us what we can actually still do about it. Look out for the season's first climate change episode on February 8th with Katherine Richardson. She's the leader of the Sustainability Science Center at the University of Copenhagen and one of the scientists appointed by the UN Secretary General to evaluate progress on the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. We talk about the Earth being a place with finite resources and the primary goal of the UN agenda to find a way to improve the well-being of all humans on this planet. We need to transform our society. If we are going to feed 10 billion people or we're going to give them all energy, we are going to have to plan how we're going to do that so as not to lose all of our resources. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Special production by Louisa Tucker. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. Future Hindsight.